Well, today we will be in uh, Colossians uh, uh, chapter 1. The title of our message this morning is uh, The Prayer God Answers. Uh, The Prayer God Answers. Now, as a follower of Jesus Christ, uh, prayer is our lifeline. It's our privilege. Uh, God has given you and I his word to instruct us, uh, to reveal himself to us, uh, to guide us, to convict us. Uh, Many of you may not know, but listen to what the Bible says in Psalm 138, verse 2. It says, for you have magnified your word above all your name. We know that the name of Jesus is powerful, that uh, we are uh, baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, that those of, those of us that have given our lives to Jesus, we know that it was in Jesus' name that uh, we, uh, we what, say to, said the sinner's prayer. We know that when we pray for someone or we pray for ourselves, or our family members, we end it off with in Jesus' name. So we know Jesus' name is powerful. The psalmist teaches us that the Lord has exalted his word even above his name. So his name is powerful. We also are going to learn today that his word is powerful. You might remember when Jesus was being tempted of the devil in the wilderness. Uh, Does anybody remember how Jesus responded to the devil's uh, temptations? It is written. So even in Jesus' temptation, he responded with the word of God. Why? Because the word of God is powerful. Now, when it comes to prayer, family, uh, many of us fall in a few camps. Uh, Some would say, I want to be more disciplined in the area of prayer. Some would say, I want to pray. I just don't I just don't know how to pray. Some would say, well, I just uh, don't pray enough. And others, well, what do I say when I pray? Well, today, Colossians chapter one gives you and I a wonderful outline of what to pray and how to pray. A little background before we jump into Colossians chapter one. Uh, The church at Colossae uh, was started by a man named Epaphras. He was part of the ministry of the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter, I believe, 15 through 17. So Epaphras hears the gospel. He goes back to Colossae. He starts this wonderful church. Things are going really, really good, really great. However, there was a problem. A group called the Gnostics crept into the church. The Gnostics believed that all matter was evil. So they believe you can do whatever you want to do with your flesh. Have as much pleasure as you want because the body doesn't matter. All that matters is the spirit. Well, the main problem with that is they then don't believe that Jesus was God come in the flesh. Because if matter was evil, why would God clothe himself in Uh, in flesh. So Epaphras goes back to Paul and he says, hey, we've got some problems. Remember, Paul's in prison. So Epaphras says, hey, Paul, we've got some problems in Colossae. There's this uh, Gnostic teaching going on. um, We're living in a Jewish community. So there's this legalism that's going on that, hey, in order for us to know God more, have this higher, higher enlightenment, we need to get circumcised. There was Eastern thought going on. So the church is going through a difficult time. So as Epaphras tells Paul all this, Paul then pins a letter to Epaphras to uh, address some of these issues that they are going through in Colossae. Well, let's pray, and then we'll jump into our text this morning. Father in heaven, we thank you for your son Jesus. Thank you for being so good to us. We pray today that you would give us ears, ears to hear, and then that you would give us courage to respond your word in First Chronicles 29, 11 says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Father, we pray that your will would be done in every single person's life here and those that are online and those that will hear this message months and years from now that your will would be done. Spirit of God, come and do a great work in us and through us. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. When you get to Colossians chapter 1, church, give us an amen. amen. Good job, everybody. If you're new to following you some Jesus, Colossians is in the New Testament. It's an epistle called a letter. Colossians chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 9 through 14, and it says this. It says, for this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, 
do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthen with all might according to his glorious what family? His power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. What has he done? He has delivered us from the power of what? Darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have what family? Redemption through what? His blood, the forgiveness of sins. And the church said, Amen and amen. If you are a note taker this morning, as we talk about the prayer God answers, we're going to learn that, number one, prayer must be ongoing. Prayer must be ongoing. Paul says in verse 9, for this reason, since the day we heard it, we do not cease to pray for you. Now, I'm certain that uh, maybe this has happened to you or uh, someone has said this to you. Hey, brother or sister, I prayed for you. Now, that's a beautiful thing. But what we want to say is, hey, brother and sister, I am continuously praying for you. As the Lord brings you to my mind, I'm going to continue to pray for you. That family, our prayers should never be one and done. Our prayers shouldn't be, well, I, I said it once and, and that is enough. No, the Bible instructs you and I to, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, that we are to pray without what? Pray without ceasing. That means that you and I are to always be in an attitude of, of prayer, that we are always to have this connection with God. Now, as we pray, we don't always have to keep our eyes closed because there's sometimes I pray on the freeway, like I'm sure many of you do, and we definitely shouldn't close our eyes when we do that. But we should remain in an attitude of connectedness with the Lord. I believe it was last week or the week before, and I live in Beaumont, so we had some crazy wind storms and we had some power outages. And when the power went out, we lost connection to the internet. The lights wouldn't work, obviously, because there was no there was no connection. So uh, the electric company sent us all a text, hey, we know that there is an outage in your area. We're working hard to fix it. So no matter what you and I w did during the outage, uh, we had to do it without power because there was no connection. As you and I are walking this thing called life, as we are walking with Jesus, there always should be a, a connection with the Lord. Now, unfortunately, there's sometimes the Bible says that our sin has separated us from the Lord Jesus Christ. So whenever we do sin, we want to make sure we quickly confess so we can have this connection so that you and I can pray without ceasing. And how wonderful that the Apostle Paul has this, he has this lifestyle of praying for the church. He has this lifestyle of praying for one another. And you and I can follow suit with that. We can pray as we're around the house. We can pray as we're shopping, as we're at work, as we're driving. We can remain in this attitude of prayer. In Romans chapter 1 verse 9, Paul says, For God is my witness, whom I serve in my spirit in the gospel of his son. It says that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. Imagine this family, somebody saying to you, I'm always praying for you. I'm always lifting you up to the Lord. I'm always praying that God would bless you and that God would keep you, that God would encourage you. If somebody told me that, I'd be, thank you so much because there's not one person in here that doesn't need a little bit of prayer and a lot of prayer all the time. So Paul is encouraging the church. I'm praying for you. The church at Thessalonica, you are to pray without ceasing. Jesus invites you and I to ask and to seek and to knock. In Luke chapter 18, there is a wonderful text. It's called the persistent widow. Basically, she just kept coming back and coming back to this judge, coming back again. The judge is going, oh, my goodness, if I don't answer uh, this woman's cry for help. She's going to keep coming back and coming back. Family, why is this in our Bible? Jesus wants you and I to continue to pray, continue to lift one another up, to continue to, to ask him, continue to seek him, and continue to knock. Now, what's beautiful is that Jesus says, I invite you to do these things. Now, if nobody invited you and you kept going like this, you would say, that's annoying. But Jesus says, no. You can ask as much as you want. 
That's a beautiful thing that we can ask as much as we want. We're going to learn later on what we need to ask for. So, so far we've learned that it's important to, to pray without ceasing. So our next question is, well, what do we pray? Do, I, do we pray whatever comes to our mind? Do we pray about a feeling that we have? No, family, our prayers should be specific. Listen to the latter part of verse 9. It says, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So our next point this morning is prayer must be according to God's will. Prayer must be according to God's will. So as you and I pray for ourselves and pray for one another, be careful that we're not just praying whatever comes into our minds. Be even careful that we're not praying what we believe that they need. When you and I do things like that, it's always going to come in under what God would have for us. But whenever you and I pray this over people, think about this family. This is a copy of God's word to us. So this is uh, the inerrant word of God. It's, it's, it's profitable for reproof, for reproof, for correction, and that the man of God may be equipped. This is God's literal word to us. So why would we then pray something other than God's word? So no matter if you've been following Jesus for a day, if you've been baptized, if you were baptized this weekend at Corona del Mar, or you've been walking with Jesus for decades, if you were a newbie or if you've been, again, de decades walking with Jesus, any of us can take this word. Your brother and sister say, well, I have a need today. Ooh, you need some prayer, don't you? Let me grab my Bible and just simply say this. Lord, according to your word, I pray that you would fill my brother and my sister with the knowledge of your will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. It's prayers like that that God hears and that God answers. Now, Sometimes when we pray, we don't receive what we pray for because the Bible says we ask amiss. James 4, verse 3, it says this. Uh, you ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Sometimes, family, our prayers are, are self-serving. Uh, uh, I like to joke around my church a little bit. Uh, I think Powerball a few months ago was, what, a billion dollars? And I said, don't you mess around and pray. Well, God, you know, if you would allow me to hit Powerball, I'll give 10% to the church, to which God will reply, you don't give 10% now. <laughs> You're not going to give 10% if you hit Powerball. You see, if we pray for things like that, Lord, if you bless me with this and bless me with that, then I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. That's asking amiss. So what type of prayers does God always hear? How can you and I pray with confidence knowing that God will hear and answer our prayer? Listen to 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. It says, now this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, what happens, family? He hears us. And if we know that he hears us, Whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked for. So have you ever said, God, here's, here, here's, here's a prayer. And maybe you're thinking, I wonder if God heard that prayer. I, I said in Jesus' name and I still haven't heard a response yet. I, 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 I don't know if, if what I've prayed has entered into the, the ears of God. If you and I are followers of Jesus, God wants you and I to have confidence when we pray. That's what 1 John 5 says right here. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. How many of you have kids? All right, all right. So we all know that our kids ask for some crazy things sometimes. Uh, maybe your, your kid is uh, maybe in, in elementary school and they ask for a cell phone and your answer should have been, no, you don't need it right now. Maybe when you get older, you're going to need it. But right now, you don't need that. So my answer is no for now. Maybe your kids, you know, are junior high school. May I take the car, Dad? Definitely not. Because I've not taught you how to drive yet. So what you are asking for is not my will for your life right now. But soon. When you finish driver's ed and as I teach you to drive and you get your permit, then you may take the car. 
But when they ask something according to our will for them, the answer is yes. Mom and dad, do you need anything? How can I help you today? You're going to say, what happened to our kid? They're asking, they're asking to help. Yes, you can help. So the answer is yes when they ask something according to our will for their lives. Family, it's the same with the Lord Jesus Christ. When you and I ask in prayer something of the Lord and it's according to his will for our lives, the answer is always yes. How do we know? It's here in the scriptures. If we ask anything according to his will. Now you might say, well, pastor, man, this all sounds great. What if we don't know if what we're asking is according to his will? That's a great question. Does anybody remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane? When he says, he says, Father, uh, if it's possible, let this what? Let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not what? My will, but what? Yours be done. So Jesus is saying, hey, disciples, hey, come and pray with me. He, hey, sit here. He goes to pray. He prays this one time, and he, he comes back, and they're sleeping. He goes back again. He says, Father, if it's possible, let, let this cup pass. Nevertheless, not, not my will be done, but yours be done. Jesus prayed this, that same prayer three times. What a wonderful illustration for you and I. When we're not sure what God's will is, we end our prayer with, nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. There's times when people say, hey, can you, can you pray for me? I need, I need healing. I'd love to pray with you, pray some scripture over them. But at the end, Lord, not my will be done, but your will be done. Because maybe it's not God's will to heal everyone. I mean, eventually all of us are going to get healed, but we want to leave it in God's hands. So you and I can have confidence that when we pray that God hears us, when we ask according to this. So I'm excited for all of us when we get home today because you want to begin to, to pray with this. So here in our text, what's God's will for the life of the believer? Listen to verse 10. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Our third point this morning is prayer must encourage Christ-like living. Prayer must encourage Christ-like living. There's times when we ask for 101 other things instead of saying, Lord, make me more like you. Help me to walk like you. Help me to, to trust. Help me to, to, to live a life of faith. Uh, help me to, to walk worthy of you. Do you see the difference between the Apostle Paul's prayer and sometimes the prayers that, that we pray? And again, family, don't, don't misunderstand me. We all have needs. God, we need save our kids, we, you know, jobs and finances and, and health issues and uh, the past that sometimes we, we struggle with. But here we see that this prayer that Paul has for the church is very specific. Lord, help me to walk worthy of the calling that you have in my life. Uh, there's times when, you know, driving down the 10, you, you see people, they're obviously texting their phone and their car is doing a little swerve, doing a little swerve, and you, you, you speed up and you, and you look and you see them going, they're, they're, down like, they're down like this. Sometimes in our lives, family, we're swerving. We're, 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 walk, we're following Jesus. Sometimes we follow Jesus and we're, we're on that narrow path. And other times we just start swerving a little bit. This is when we need to pray. God, my, 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 my prayer is that you would help me to walk worthy. Think about this, family. The Lord will never ask you and I to do something that he'll never empower us to do. He'll never ask us to do something without giving us the power to do it. We're going to hear about that in, in, in a couple of minutes. So, Lord, I need you to help me to walk worthy of who you called me, uh, called me to be, that you've, you, you, you've delivered me from, from darkness into your marvelous light. So I need you to give me the strength to, to walk worthy. And listen to this, not only to walk worthy, but it says fully pleasing him. It doesn't say kind of pleasing him, once in a while pleasing him. Lord, I need, I need you to help me to walk worthy of you and that I would please you in my life. Then he goes on and he says, being fruitful in, in every good work. 
maybe you're new to following you Je some Jesus and you're thinking, what does it mean to, to be fruitful? Does anybody have any fruit trees at home? Maybe? All right, a couple of them. So fruit trees are, they're beautiful if it works, right? So my one friend, he has uh, several fruit trees and some of them are, are blossoming. He uh, puts the right amendments in it. He's uh, pruning them when he should prune them. He's got little foil things, you know, hanging from the leaves to keep the, the, the birds and animals away. He's watering them as he should, but one tree just wasn't growing. So he says, wow, okay, out of all these trees, this one tree's not growing. So he's, you know, tilling up the soil a little bit, putting all these amendments in it, doing what he can, and the tree still didn't bear any fruit. So what did he have to do? He, he dug it up. He did all that he could. He gave it time. Uh, he, he gave it care. And it still didn't grow. If you and I are followers of Jesus, our lives should be different. For you and I to say that I'm a follower of Jesus, but our lives have not changed, uh, something, is, something is wrong. Something is inconsistent. So as followers of Jesus, our lives should continually be bearing fruit. Uh, think of it like this. The more you and I know of Jesus, the more time we spend with Jesus, the more we should act like Jesus sound like Jesus and talk like Jesus. Amen? And no amens for that. We'll, we'll get there in a couple minutes. Uh, Jesus, uh, help us that we would be connected to you. What, what does John 15 say? That we are to abide in him. Then as you and I are, are abiding in him, we're going to grow and bear some wonderful fruit. Paul didn't say this just to the church in Colossae to to bear fruit. He says it also to the church in Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1. He says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to what? Walk worthy of the calling which you were called. This is a beautiful encouragement for the church that since you and I have been saved, since you and I have been transformed and redeemed, there is a way in which we should walk. And this word walk doesn't mean this way. It just means a living in a way that's glorifying to the Lord. He told the same thing to the church in Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. It says that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Now, I'm not sure what your prayer life is like if when you pray, if you're really honest with the Lord, if your prayer is kind of like, well, Lord, you know what I did. You know that I had a bad attitude today or Lord, you, you know the things that I'm going through. If our kids came in and talked to us like that, you would say, what are you talking about? Look, talk straight. Talk straight to me. Lord, you know the conversation that I had with this person, how I did not represent you, you well. You know that I have not been walking worthy of you, but I need you to empower me. I need you to strengthen me that I might walk worthy. Because I, Jesus, help me to not act like the person you saved me from, right? Jesus, help me to not act like that person. That person is dead. He's been crucified with Christ. So the, 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 the moments that I begin to act like the dead person you saved me from, Jesus, help me. It's prayers like that that God always answers. Romans 8, chapter 1, it says, There, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So there's a way in which you and I should walk, brothers and sisters, that we would glorify the Lord, to walk, to walk worthy. Now, don't get me wrong. We're all on our journey with Jesus, right? None of us are perfect. We're walking through this thing called life, and sometimes we do really, really good. Other times we do really, really bad. Jesus, help us, strengthen us to walk worthy of the Lord, which leads us to our next point. Number four, prayer is asking for God's strength. Listen to verse 11, family. Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. Strengthen with, with whose might? With his might. It also says strengthen with, with some, a portion, a bit. No, no, no. It says strengthen with all might according to what kind of power? Glorious. I don't know what glorious power is, but it seems to be greater than just power. 
So here in our text, Paul is praying for the church that they would be strengthened, not with some might, not just with a little bit of might, but with all might. This is according to his glorious power. Now, this may not excite you, but it sure excites me. Because what Jesus requires of us to do, he's not asking for you and I to do it in our own strength. He's not saying, okay, now you're saved. Good luck. Good luck with this thing called life. Good luck fighting all of the temptations, all of the struggles. Good luck. No, 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 no. He says, I'm praying for you, church at Colossae, that you would be strengthened with all of God's might according to his glorious power. You know the reason why so many believers don't step out in faith? Because we're afraid to fail. Think about this, family. God has called all of us to something. I am quite certain God has blessed every one of us in here with, with at least one gift. That's biblical. So we all have at least one gift. Uh, what, is, what has been stopping you from stepping out in faith? Maybe for some of you that are starting a business. Maybe some of you are uh, uh, musicianly uh, inclined. Maybe writing a book or, 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 or doing something for the kingdom. What's stopping you? For, the, for most, it's fear. Well, what if it doesn't work? Well, when did God say, I want you to uh, worry about the results? That's not, that's not found in here. Uh, that if the Lord is leading you to do something, and if you and I are waiting to not do it because, well, what if it doesn't work out? The Lord desires our obedience, family. He desires our obedience. If you and I are waiting to, to make sure that it all equals out, what if the Lord says, I've got a little, I've got a different accounting system than you have? You guys know, you guys know your scriptures. You're, you're well taught here. Jesus fed the 5,000 with a couple of loaves and a few fish. So uh, the, the, the story breaks down as Jesus is, uh, has been teaching and crowds are following him. And uh, the disciples say, hey, Jesus, this is a desolate place. Uh, send the people away. Jesus says, um, hey, you... How many, how, many, how many loaves and fish do we have? And they're like, we just got a, we just got a couple. They're, they're like, Jesus, we, we don't have enough for this multitude. Jesus says, tell everybody to sit down. You guys know the story. Jesus blesses it, breaks, uh, breaks the bread, and, and feeds, uh, feeds all of the, the 5,000, uh, not counting uh, women and children. What if the disciples said, Jesus, the math doesn't work. We know you're great and all, but the math doesn't work. We know the story. Whenever Jesus is involved, the, the impossible then goes to possible. One of my favorite stories is uh, the, Jesus told his disciples to cross over to the other side. So they're in a boat. They're rowing, and it's, 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 it's not working out well. They see Jesus uh, walking on the water, and they're, they're afraid. They think it's a ghost, and Jesus says, hey, uh, fear not. It is I. Remember what Simon Peter said? He says, Lord, if it's you, what did he say? Command me to what? Come out of this boat onto the water to you. Jesus didn't say, Simon, that's stupid. No one can walk on water. It's not going to work. It's impossible for you to do it. Simon, ask for something that's possible. Jesus said, come on. Simon said, she didn't tell me twice. Stepped out of the boat. He, he had a few glorious moments, right? He had a couple steps. He's like, ta-da! Of course, he, he sank. But you notice that when he sank, he immediately what? He called out for Jesus to save me. Jesus didn't say, such a failure. I can't believe you don't know how to walk on water. I can't believe you didn't trust me. Learn your lesson. Keep sinking and sinking and sinking. And then when you learn the lesson, then I'll come save you. No, the Bible says immediately. Immediately he pulled him up. Simon could have said, it's impossible for me to do this, Jesus. But yet he still asked. I tell you this story, family, because if you call Simon Peter a failure in that instance, you need to re redefine failure. He's the only person besides Jesus to walk on water. Now, you might say, well, he sunk. I'd do it. I'd do it. And I hope that you would do it too, knowing that you would sink. Why? Because you had a few glorious moments of trusting Jesus. 
a few glorious moments of doing the impossible. Family, what were the other 11 doing? They were looking. Why? They were probably afraid to fail. Why didn't they say, ooh, if you said, yes, Simon can come out, can I come out too? But instead of asking, they just simply watched. And they missed, they missed a moment of a lifetime because they were afraid and they were fearful. We all know that the scriptures, there's nothing special about Simon Peter. But he trusted the Lord and he walked on water. I've heard it said that Simon Peter walked on Jesus' words, come. He said, okay, the Lord said I could come, so I'm going to walk and trust what the Lord has said. What is fear keeping you back from today, family? Oh, what is that? You say, well, it may not work out. Maybe the Lord is not concerned with it working out as he's concerned with you trusting, trusting him. Think about this. Believers in Jesus, filled with his spirit, afraid to trust him. This should not be so, family. And let's say you, you step out there in faith, and let's say it doesn't work out. Try it again. Try it again. Because the Lord wants our obedience. Lord, I believe you are leading me to do this. I'm just going to follow you, and I'm just going to see what's going to happen. My, my, my allegiance is is to you and not to, not to my failures. That, Lord, if you're calling me and you're drawing me in, and I'm so certain many of you have had that same thought in your mind for years, and then you call it, you're kind of spiritual. Well, we're still, we're still praying on it. Be careful we don't use prayer as an excuse to not go. Be careful we don't use prayer as an excuse to, to not go. We're reading this morning about all of his might. We're reading about his glorious power but still yet some of you won't go what else does the lord have to do to encourage us to trust him most likely he's not gonna peel back this guy and say okay hey living way i'm real see you soon he's not gonna do that he's given us he's given us this and if you and i can't trust this that means we're walking by sight and not by faith the bible says we're to walk by faith and not by sight here in our text, the Apostle Paul is, is trying to encourage the church. God's got some strength for you. God's got some glorious power for you. Listen to Ephesians 3.16. It says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. So you and I are given strength from God that's a beautiful thing that since you have strengthened me with your might what can't I do now with our own strength there's a whole bunch of stuff we can't do once in a while I'll be at home and I'm working on a project and I have a drill and it's it starts off then eventually it goes that means I've run out of some juice. I've got to go and get the other one. Then I slap a new one in, but eventually it's going to die out. When you and I are plugged in to the Lord, empowered by his spirit, we can accomplish great things because it's his power and it's his strength. So that's why we don't ever have to, we should never be so shy and so, so timid because it's his strength. And we should always be confident that God will show up when we pray because we are praying his scriptures. Lord, strengthen my inner person. Lord, strengthen me. And maybe you, you have, a, we have a, a few habits we're trying to break. When's the last time you said, Lord, strengthen me with your might according to your glorious power? Instead of saying that, sometimes our prayer is, Lord, um, take the desire from me. How's that working out for you? Lord, take this desire from me. What if the Lord says, no, I'm not going to take the desire from you. What are you going to do then? Are we going to keep praying, Lord, take the desire from me? No, 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 no. We then want to pray the scriptures, Lord, if you're not going to take this desire from me, I need your strength. He says, yeah, 
Exactly. We don't need the Lord to always take something from us. Lord, empower me that I might walk through this thing. Does that make sense, family? Lord, if you're not going to remove uh, the struggle, if you're not going to remove the, 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 the temptation, if you're not going to uh, take the desire from me, I'm going to need your strength. Sometimes, family, we, we come at things at, at the wrong angle. Maybe it's smoking. Lord, help me to stop smoking. Lord, take the desire for, for cigarettes away. What if he says no? Lord, take this desire for alcohol. Take this desire for pornography. Take, take all of these things away. What if the answer is no? Okay, Lord. So what do we do now? I still have the desire. I still have the temptation. I still have the trials. Ooh, Lord, you know what I've not been praying for? I've not been praying for your strength. Because my strength is not enough. And no matter how hard I try, no matter what roadblocks I put in the way, no matter what way I, I drive home, no matter all of the, the things that, that I do to, to make sure I'm not tempted, I still have this desire. So, Lord, your strength is greater than any desire. Your strength is greater than anything that I, can, that I, can ever, that I will ever uh, go through. So, Lord, I'm praying for you to give me your strength. Listen to Ephesians 6.10. It says, finally, my brethren... Be strong in what? In yourself? No, it says be strong in the Lord and in the power of whose might? His might. How encouraging is this? The Bible is always pointing you and I in the direction of the Lord. Never are we going to hear, hey, well, you're strong enough. Go ahead and do it. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of, of his might. And not only do we have strength, family, but we have strength, it says, for all patience and long suffering with joy. What? Can we have long suffering and joy in the same sentence? Now, if I was writing the Bible, which I have not, nor will, I would have put joy first and then and then long suffering. It, it makes sense that way to have joy, the capstone of everything. And then if I have some joy, then I can be a little long-suffering. No, no, no. God in his wisdom, we're filled with his might, with his power for all patience and long-suffering with joy. Maybe you're suffering today. I would love to ask, how's your joy? How was your joy as you're going through this really difficult time? You might say, well, Pastor Man, it's, it's difficult, so I don't have any joy. I hear you. It's just not biblical. You and I should, must have joy even in difficult times because if that's not the case, what tends to happen with believers is, oh, there's no joy here. Let me try joy here. Oh, no joy here. Let me try joy here. So we're going around trying to find this thing called joy. And then when we find it, we keep it like this. That's just not biblical. That we can find joy and peace in the midst of a storm. You guys remember the story when uh, Jesus is in the boat with his disciples. Uh, the, the wind and the waves became boisterous. Waters fill in the boat. What was Jesus doing? You guys remember? He was sleeping. So in the middle of a storm, the disciples said, we are perishing. Think about this. They were fishermen. And they said, we are perishing. So Water's filling the boat, wind's going like this, waves going like this. Jesus is sleeping. Why? Because Jesus knew he wasn't going to die on a boat. He was going to die on a cross. So they said, somebody wake up Jesus. I would have said, I'm not waking Jesus up. He, he's sleeping right now. Let's. So they, they wake him up, and they woke, they woke him up and said, they said this, don't you care if we die? Jesus gets up, he says, Everybody calm down. Peace be still. The wind and the waves obeyed him. And the disciples are going, who is this? Jesus had peace in a storm. Why didn't the disciples say, hey, Jesus, scoot over. Let me sleep next to you. If you're not concerned, I'm not concerned. If you've got peace, then I've got peace. Here in our text, you and I have the strength for all patience and long suffering with joy. Maybe you're going through a really difficult time right now and you're like, Lord, how, how much longer? Lord, it's been, it's been a long season. It's been a painful season. 
Family, what are you learning in your season? Have you found joy in your season? Have you found joy in, in, in the long suffering? And I know, I know it's hard, family, because I know life is tough. But let's not miss joy, knowing that God is sovereign over all things. That when, when, when he's done with us, we'll be out of our season. Uh, Thanksgiving is rapidly approaching, and around my house, we, we like to eat a lot. But we don't like to eat raw turkey. Now, I do love me some, some sashimi, some raw fish. That's good to eat raw. But as we are preparing a turkey, you put it in the oven, and you stab it with that little plunger thing, and when it's ready, the thing comes up, and you, you take it out, you look at it, and sometimes you're like, it's not, it's not ready yet. So you put it back in again. So you don't take it out until it's ready. The Lord is doing something in and through all of us. And sometimes we're just not ready to come out yet. So while we're in what we're in, let us find some, some joy because we have some, some strength. So we have this long suffering with joy. And how beautiful that we can find patience in long suffering. Patience is kind of hard for us, isn't it? Lord, get me out. We live in a microwave uh, culture. Lord, I prayed a couple seconds ago and you've not answered it yet. What's wrong with you? So then we, we pray again. And just maybe the Lord is doing something. He's teaching us. He's growing us. And it's a good thing that the Lord doesn't always answer our prayers the minute that we say in Jesus' name. Sometimes we may have to wait, but he's building something in us. Well, there are other aspects to prayer than asking. Listen to verse 12. Uh, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Our next point this morning is prayer is giving thanks to God. Let me ask you this, family. Do you give thanks to God before you see what you're asking for, or do you wait to give thanks? So, Lord, bless me with this. We need this, 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 and this, and this. In Jesus' name, we go about our business, we're working, we're driving, doing our thing. And then, Lord willing, he blesses what we ask for. Oh, praise the Lord, that thing worked out. What if you and I were to be thankful right after we pray? Lord, I thank you for what you're going to do. I thank you for hearing this prayer. I don't see it right now, the result of this prayer, but I want to tell you that I'm thankful because it is coming to your ears. And since it's coming to your ears, I'm confident that you heard it because it was according to your will. So I am grateful and thankful right now, although I don't see it. That's how we pray, family. Be careful of, of waiting to be thankful. The Lord's going, you don't want to say thank you? You don't want to say thank you now? Oh, oh you're waiting until, until you see. Be careful that we're not letting these things dictate our faith. That when I see the Lord at work and when I feel the Lord is doing something, then I'm going to be grateful. Family, Jesus deserves all of our praise when we don't feel like it, when we're sick, when we're healthy, when we have, when we don't have. At the first of the month when we have money and at the 18th, 19th of the month where money is a little low. Uh, um, has anybody ever had to put some, uh, some water in milk to make it? Make it stretch a little bit. All right. I talked to my church about this once in a while, and they kind of look at me a little funny. Once in a while, you had to put some water and some ketchup and give it a little, give it a little something, something, because that's just, that's where we've been. But we're grateful for, for what we had. Where I come from, we didn't have a whole bunch. We used to have fried bologna sandwiches. Anybody ever, ever have one of those? Woo! You had to take off the little plastic piece, though, right, around, around it first, because that, that wouldn't melt. We, we would, we would. Take the, the plastic piece off, and if you wanted it really good, you'd, you'd put it right on the burner. And then it would, it would bubble up, and then you would flip it over. And if, and if, if you had a, a little bit of something, you had to use Wonder Bread. And then you would toast that Wonder Bread. And then if you felt like a gourmet chef, you would, you would, you would, you would cut it diagonally. I mean, this, this was a great, great lunch, right? This was a, a great snack. We didn't have much, but we were thankful. Lord, thank you for this toasted fried bologna sandwich that we are 
that we are having right now. We didn't say, Lord, we're going to get, we're going to be thankful when we're, when we're eating at Fleming's and having some filet mignon. No, we're thankful for, for the top ramen and sriracha, right? Or, or, or we're thankful for, for the little things. So family, when was the last time you just said, Lord, thank you for the bed that I woke up in, right? Thank you for the car that I drove here. And thank you for uh, an air-conditioned building. Thank you for lights. Thank you for, 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 you, for your goodness and your, and your mercy. We should be a, a thankful, thankful people. It says he has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He's qualified us. This meant that there was a time when we weren't qualified to, to be part of this, uh, these partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. What has he done, family? Verse 13, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. It says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Our last point for this morning is uh, prayer is rejoicing in God. Prayer is rejoicing. Uh, you might have noticed that we aren't being delivered. We have been delivered. That uh, we are not uh, being changed. We have been changed. The Bible says that if any man is in Christ, that he is a, a, a new what? A new creation. All things have what? Passed away, and all things have become, have become new. So you and I are completely different than who we used to be. I love the illustration of a, a caterpillar, nice and, 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 and kind of chubby, and, and they're, they're crawling around on the ground. Eventually, that caterpillar will go into what's called a chrysalis. They'll go into a, a co cocoon, and then God does some marvelous things with that, and then a butterfly emerges. Think of this. A caterpillar goes to a butterfly. A butterfly never again becomes a caterpillar. Why? Because it's been transformed. We have been delivered. Ephesians 5, 8 says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So walk as children of the light that we were once something, now we are something completely different. So since we're completely different, why would we walk the way we used to walk? No, 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 no. We would walk as the changed man, as the changed woman walks. Not only have we been changed, but we have been uh, conveyed. This word means transferred us into the kingdom of the son of his love. How glorious. Family life here on earth will never be perfect. We're going to have pain in the body. We're going to have some trials and tribulations. But we must look past the temporary and remember what God the Father has done in our lives. I don't know where you've been. I don't know what kind of life you used to live. But if you're here at church, I am certain this means you once were something, and now you're something completely different. And our prayer is, Lord, I'm not all that I should be, but praise the Lord, I'm not who I used to be. Glory to God. Lord, I'm not there yet, but I know I'm not who I, this person that I used to be. Listen to verse 14, so beautiful in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Family, it was on the cross where your sins and my sins were nailed. Uh, our past sins, our present sins, and our future sins were nailed to the cross. We've, we've been redeemed. Anybody ever turn in any water bottles or cans to the local recycling plant? Yeah, so in Beaumont, we've got this big one, so... We drink a lot of water in my house. So we had just bags everywhere in the garage. So we uh, wanted to uh, recycle them. So we, we would uh, go to the recycling plant. And on, on all, most bottles of water, if not all, there is a, a redemptive value to this. So this, we turn this in, it, it's worth something. Now, some of the, the bottles that we turned in, some were crushed, some were twisted, uh, some looked like they'd been through a war. Um, some were tall, some were small, but they all had a redemptive value. So we pull up to this place, we put all of our uh, water bottles in the receptacle, we bring them over to the guy, and he says, you need to take the caps off. That would have been nice to know a half an hour ago. So we take the bottles back, we're, 
We separate out the caps and we give him the water bottles back. He weighs them and he gives us a little, a little ticket. He's like, all right, we'll do this. Take it next door. So we take it next door and no one's ever there. So we go, bing, 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 bing. The guy comes out, what? Ta-da, give my little ticket. He gives us money for what we have redeemed. Regardless of the condition of the water bottle, if it was new, if it was old, if it was tall, if it was short, if it was twisted, if it was straight, it had a, re- it had a redemptive value. You and I have a redemptive value. Regardless of where you've been, how long you've been there, what you look like, what you've done, we have a redemptive value that Jesus has redeemed you and I, and we have been set free, so there should be some rejoicing, and God forbid, family, that you and I would let what we're currently going through somehow uh, mask the greatness of God and saving our souls. Something is wrong, that if we somehow don't uh, find reasons to worship the Lord on a daily basis, something is wrong. We're, we're going to have pain, struggles, trials, temptations. We're going to cry. We're going to yell. We're going to scream. But Jesus is good. Jesus is great. That if, if he doesn't bless me in any other way, he saved my soul. That's good enough for me. That, that when you and I stand before the Lord and he says, you are forgiven, glory to God. Glory to God that he's not going to say, well, Henry, we need to talk about your sins. I'm like, oh, it's going to be a long conversation, Lord. Huh, Jesus, no, no, no. The cross, you have forgiven me of all of my sins. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, and then we got to go. I think we're out of time, right? Close? All right. 1 Peter 2, verse 9. It says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, Listen to this family, his own special people. That's why we got to read our Bibles, family. If you're ever walking around going, ah, I just don't feel like anybody loves me. Nobody cares about me. Read your Bible. We are his own special people. Listen to this, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into what? His marvelous light. You notice it didn't say that you and I came out of darkness. We walked out of darkness. No, no. He called us out of darkness. Why would he do that? Knows all of our sin, has seen all of our sin. He calls us out of our darkness into sunlight. Mm -mm -mm. Marvelous, marvelous light. How glorious is Jesus that our sin did not scare him. Oh, they're, 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 they're entrenched in sin. I'll wait until they get better. No, sir. No, ma'am. Jesus called us out of our darkness into his marvelous light. Why wouldn't we praise him? Why wouldn't we say, Jesus, you know, my body hurts. You know, our marriage is, is, is just on the rocks. You know, their kids need, need saving. You know, we've got some addictions. You know we're struggling. But, Lord, thank you for calling me out of darkness. Thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for being great. Jesus, I want to praise you now. I don't want to praise you just when I see you. Oh, you're real. No, I want to praise you right now. Hey, before we go, let me, let me show you what I'm hoping that we will all do from this day on as we, as we begin praying the scriptures. Uh, Psalm 119 is the longest uh, scripture uh, passage in the Bible. I want to read to you a, a short little passage and then I want to pray for you. Psalm 119, verse 33 through 40. It says, Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to covetousness. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. Establish your word to your servant who is devoted to fearing you. Turn away my reproach, which I dread, for your judgments are good. 
Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me in your righteousness. So the way that you and I then pray this is this. Father in heaven, my prayer is that you would teach me the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it. Father, give me understanding, and I shall keep your word. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Father, I need you to help me to make me walk in the paths of your commandments, for I delight in it. Lord, incline your ear to your, to, to your testimonies. Incline my ear to your testimonies and not to covetousness. Lord, help to turn my way, turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things. I'm asking, Lord, that you would revive me in your way. Lord, establish your word to your servant as I'm devoted to fearing you. Help me to turn away my reproach, which I dread. For your judgments, Lord, are good. Behold, I'm longing for your precepts. I need you to revive me in your righteousness. Family, when we pray this prayer, the Lord hears this prayer because it's his word to us. So now if you're ever thinking, well, I don't know what to pray, pray the scriptures. Can we pray together? Lord, thank you for being so good and so great. Wonderful are you. Thank you for drawing us and calling us out of darkness into your marvelous light. Thank you for nailing our sins to a cross that we're free, that we're free in you. And Jesus, help us to make the time to spend with you in, in prayer. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters this morning that they would be filled with the knowledge of your will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that they would walk worthy of you, that they would be fully pleasing to you, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of who you are, that you would strengthen with all might according to your glorious power for all patience and long-suffering with joy, that they would be a thankful people, Father, because you've qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Glory to God that you've delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of your love. We are rejoicing that we have redemption through your blood, the forgiveness of sins. If you're...